Hello and welcome to the Dissect and Connect podcast. I'm your host, Mike Wade. This is the podcast where we explore population health issues impacting your community. Dissect and Connect is a service of New River Valley Community Services and the Montgomery County Prevention Partners. Dr. Jolene Henshaw is a board-certified general surgeon with Lewis Gale Regional Health System in Blacksburg, Virginia. Dr. Henshaw earned her medical degree from the University of Arizona and completed her residency in general surgery at Southern Illinois University. She is board certified by the American Board of Surgery. Dr. Henshaw is a member of the American College of Surgeons. Procedures Dr. Henshaw performs include hernia repair, gallbladder, and breast surgery, including biopsies and lumpectomy. So, Dr. Henshaw, welcome to the Dissect and Connect podcast. It's nice to be here. So honored to be talking to you today. And this is a topic that uh, obviously hits home for many of us, uh, including myself. I lost my mother to breast cancer when she was just 45 years old. So I know this is an important topic. Obviously, we're also recording this during um, Breast Cancer Awareness Month in October. So um, just want to jump right into the conversation and uh, wonder if you could talk maybe a little bit about the prevalence of breast cancer in the U.S. So breast cancer is very common. One in eight women is going to get breast cancer sometime in their life, which is about 12% risk. Uh, That equals about 276,000 cases in the United States this year alone. So very common cancer. And unfortunately, men can also get cancer. It's much more rare. But male breast cancer, there's going to be about 2,600 cases of male breast cancer. Okay. Good to know. What are some of the most common risk factors associated with breast cancer? With breast cancer, the most common risk factors, unfortunately, are gender and age. Hmm. Obviously, women have much more breast cancer than men, so it's the highest risk. And breast cancer becomes more common every decade women get older. Most breast cancer is in women who are over age 40, but about 4% is women under age 30. So the biggest risk women have is being female and getting older. And unfortunately, you can't change either of those risks at all. Some other things that increase your risk for breast cancer, however, are family history, which you can't change, and also hormone replacement is a significant risk for breast cancer. So if you're taking estrogen after menopause, that's a significant risk to increase your chance of getting breast cancer. Can you talk a little bit more about the role that genetics plays? So genetics, when we talk about breast cancer, actually for most patients plays less risk than you would think. Only about 10% of breast cancer is related to genetic mutations that patients have, things like the BRCA mutations, and there's some other genes that are very common, things like ATM and CHECK2. But again, it's a minority of cancer. If you have cancer that is very prevalent in your family, like several first-degree relatives or ovarian cancer, those are risk factors that make us look for mutations. And those patients who have those factors should definitely be checked for mutations. But unfortunately, 85% of patients don't have family history and don't have mutations. And their cancer is just a brand new mutation that comes out of nowhere. And fortunately, a lot of those are not passed on. Wow. That's uh, that's interesting. I, I think a lot of people have the perception that genetics is a lot more of a factor in, in developing breast cancer. But that sounds like that's yeah, not the we case. Talk, we talk a lot about BRCA mutations because patients who are positive have extremely high risk for breast cancer, um, between 70 and 90 percent for some of those mutations. However, it's really important for patients to know that if they don't have that mutation, they're actually in the larger part of patients who have breast cancer. Most people are really surprised to find out that 85 percent of people don't have significant family history. One of the most common things I hear in my office is, no one in my family has breast cancer. Mm. And people are totally surprised and shocked when they get breast cancer. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's very, very common. Let's talk about some of the most significant means of prevention. So with breast cancer, a lot of breast cancer, I tell patients, is bad luck. 
There are some things you can do to decrease your risk, but I'll really strongly admit that there are small decreases in your risk. Um, things like being healthy and active, not gaining a lot of weight, and breastfeeding all decrease your risk, but there are slight decreases, only a few percent for each of those things. So I have a lot of patients who come in and say, you know, I eat right, I'm active, I've had marathon runners have breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So the things we all think, oh, we're doing all the right things, it's true that those are the right things for your health, but unfortunately, they don't guarantee you don't get breast cancer. Um, Even breastfeeding, I hear a lot, oh, I breastfed, how come I don't have, how come I have breast cancer? Well, the risk of breast cancer, or the risk of, of uh, breast cancer with breastfeeding women is only decreased by a, per- a couple percent with breastfeeding for a year. So there are small decreases, and they're good, but they certainly don't guarantee that you won't get breast cancer. Interesting. I'm learning a lot today. Let's talk about the advances in treatment. Um, I mentioned that my mother passed away. It's been a little over 20 years since uh, she passed away, and I'm assuming that things have probably uh, changed uh, over those past two decades. Can you talk about some of the latest advances? Yeah. So I have bad news about prevention, but I have good news about treatment. Good. (laughs) Um, So with treatment, breast cancer therapy has changed so much in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. Um, Surgery is still stock. You know, it's one of the first things we reach for treating breast cancer. And honestly, most patients who have breast cancer have that cancer removed from the breast. However, all the other stuff that goes along and around that has changed significantly. I think the best advance in breast cancer treatment is that we treat each cancer individually. Uh, It's important to know, and I think most people don't, that all breast cancer is not the same. It's not all equal. Um, It's kind of like fruit. Apples and bananas and oranges are all fruit, but they're not the same, and Mm -hmm. breast cancer is exactly the same. Some breast cancer is fed by estrogen, some is not, some of it grows very fast, some grows very slowly, some of it spreads early, some of it never spreads despite despite getting very large. And so the most important thing that we do now is look at each patient's individual cancer because that changes how we treat breast cancer and it's tailored specifically to that patient. So fortunately, A lot fewer patients are getting chemotherapy now. When your mom had breast cancer, probably every patient with a tumor over a centimeter got chemo. Mm -hmm. Now, we really look at that cancer, and we have a lot of other options besides chemo. Um, Some patients only have to take hormone-blocking pills, which stop estrogen. We call that endocrine therapy. Some people take other medications that treat specific proteins that are on breast cancer cells. Um, Some of them still get chemo, and nowadays, some patients don't have to do anything else besides simply have the cancer removed. Uh, We also use radiation, but we're using less radiation than we used to also. Um, So the good news for patients is that breast cancer now is more treatable. The therapy is tailored to their breast cancer. It's not one size fits all, and we have lots of options with really good survival. So I always tell patients, don't be discouraged that you have breast cancer because it's one of the cancers that, frankly, we're pretty good at treating, and patients have excellent chances at survival overall. That's great news. I mean, that is that is really exciting. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, so it sounds like the prognoses for a lot of folks has improved with the advances in the treatment. Yeah. Actually, today, breast cancer has a 90% five-year survival, um, which is really good. Mm -hmm. That survival goes down a little bit as we get further out because some people still have recurrences after five years. But really, overall, breast cancer has very good survival. Let's talk about some more of the uh, more common misconceptions. I mentioned the the thing around genetics earlier because most people feel like it's a family history type thing. But... uh, We've dispelled that, but what are some of the other misconceptions that people maybe have about breast cancer? Oh, this is one of my favorite things to talk about. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So the first one, of course, is that family history is not everything, and we talked about that a lot. Um, One of the second things I talk about is that um, just because you have a negative mammogram, it doesn't mean that there's nothing there. Mammogram doesn't pick up all cancer. 
about 20% of breast cancer is not seen on mammogram. However, so I remind people, if you notice a change or there's a new lump, just because you had a negative mammogram six months ago, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't call your doctor and have them look at it and come in and be seen. Mm -hmm. Um, I also remind people that even though it only sees 80% of breast cancer, it's still worth doing mammograms. Um, People say to me, my friend had a mammogram and it didn't see her cancer, so they're no good. But 80% is better than 0%. You know, sure. seat belts don't protect everybody in car accidents, but they save a lot of lives. Mm-hmm. So have your mammogram, but remember that if something is different and persists, it's worth seeing your physician about. Um, so that's important to remember. It is the best tool we have for finding breast cancer early. Um, another lump myth is that if there's not a lump, I don't have cancer. There's a lot of breast cancer we find, especially with mammogram, that is too small to be felt, and a lot of breast cancer that may be too deep to be felt. Mm -hmm. So just because there's no lump there, it doesn't mean it's not a cancer. Um, And also people say, I have this lump, but it's not stuck to my chest, so it's not bad. That's also a myth. Even Even if it's mobile and can shift around, it can still be a cancer. It's very rare for breast cancer to actually grow into the chest wall these days. So any kind of lump or change in the breast is worth seeing your physician about. Um, another myth that I really don't love is if I have a mastectomy, I'll never have breast cancer again. Um, I think it's important for even women who've had breast cancer um, and think, oh, I'm cured, to remember that breast cancer can always come back, and even after a mastectomy, you can have a recurrence in the skin under the mastectomy. Um, So there's nothing that prevents breast cancer from returning 100%. So again, any changes or anything you know that's different should result in you calling your physician and saying, hey, there's something new here. It's worth looking at every time. What about the um, thought process behind an elective mastectomy? So risk reducing mastectomies, as we call them, um, they used to call them prophylactic, but it doesn't 100% prevent breast cancer, so we call it risk reducing mastectomies, um, are really reserved for a a small class of patients who have extremely high risk of breast cancer. Um, Typically, we offer those to patients who have BRCA mutations um, and have risk of, you know, 60, 80 percent or more of breast cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, several other mutations like ATM mutations, check mutations, those also have pretty high risk and we offer mastectomies for those. Um, patients who have really strong family histories, sometimes we can't find a mutation, but we know that because of their family history, they've got very, very high risk. Mm-hmm. So you really have to have high risk to have a risk-reducing mastectomy. Um, and those risks have to be significant, usually 50% or more. Right. Makes so, sense. Yeah. For the average patient, it doesn't actually make a big difference in survival, partly because we're so good at treating breast cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, even a patient who has breast cancer and has a mastectomy on one side, if they don't have a genetic mutation, having a mastectomy on the other side only gives a 3% survival benefit at 10 years. So even active cancer patients, it makes very little difference overall. Um, So that particular procedure is reserved for a small percentage of patients um, who fit specific criteria. 3% over a 10-year period. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for patients who have cancer. Um, So even if you've had cancer, it still doesn't make a whole lot of difference with survival overall. Um, I seem to have heard debate in the medical field over the last couple of years about the frequency of mammograms. Where where do you stand on that? Uh-huh. Um, so there's a pretty wide variation mm-hmm. recommended by the National Present- Preventative Medicine Task Force. Um, I personally tend to lean toward annual mammograms at age 40. Um, and that's because age 40 is where breast cancer starts to really increase. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, women begin to be diagnosed with breast cancer. And they're very active, doing a lot of things, you know, in the community with their kids. Um, 
we shouldn't wait to diagnose those breast cancers. The earlier we find that breast cancer, the less treatment people have to have and the higher their survival. Um, so I still think that mammogram at age 40 is important. Um, every year to two years is an interesting question. Um, I tend to lean toward every year also, honestly. Um, I've seen enough cancers that are fast growing that I would hate to wait two or three years right. um, between mammograms. Um, so I tend to lean toward that. Um, that said, I always say, Patients, whatever patients will do. <laughs> if someone says, I'm not going to have a mammogram if I have to have one every year, I'll say, okay. How about if I, if you have to have one every other year? Mm -hmm. And they say, okay. I say, then we'll do that. Um, if you have a family history of breast cancer or if you've had precancerous cells in your breast in the past, though, you should certainly have a mammogram every year. So those are particular groups that have, should definitely have a mammogram every year. And the other thing is, when we talk about mammogram at age 40 or 50, those are not patients with family histories. Patients who have a mother with breast cancer or an aunt or a sister, they should actually start having a mammogram 10 years before the first cancer in their family. So if their sister had breast cancer at age 38, they should start having breast, having mammograms earlier at age 28 or 30. Um, so that's also a special group. Those patients need to pay attention to when their cancer and their family started. We start surveillance and looking for cancer much younger than usual. That is an important point. I'm glad you, um, I'm glad you mentioned that. Let's talk about the impact of COVID-19. Has it had an impact on, on what you've seen uh, within, your, within your practice? Um, unfortunately, it has. I have several patients who kind of put off um, mammograms or being seen for a lump because of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about screening, yeah, we put off screening, you know, just a regular mammogram, um, certainly for COVID. But that was only for a few months. We started and are back to full, full schedule of mammograms. Um, so for patients who are healthy and don't have a lot of other health issues, especially respiratory problems, and are younger, I think they should go back to having their annual screening mammogram. Mm -hmm. If patients are significantly older, you know, if they're in their 70s or 80s, especially if they have other health issues, it probably, and, there, and there's nothing going on with their breath. Everything's quiet. They haven't noticed any changes or lumps or skin changes. Then those patients, I think it's probably okay to wait a few months until hopefully we have a vaccine, um, but they're in a higher risk category. For the average patient, you know, if you're going to the grocery store, come have your mammogram. We're being very careful. They're cleaning the rooms and the mammogram machines between every patient. Everyone wears a mask, so we're taking as many precautions as possible. Um, so if you're young and healthy, it's a pretty safe thing to do to go ahead and have your mammogram. Very good. Um, I'm just curious, why did you choose this line of work? Um, <laughs> you know, I'm a, a surgeon. My specialty is breast cancer. Mm -hmm. I really like doing breast cancer because when I have patients with breast cancer, you know, I can, I can make a difference in their lives. I can save their lives. Um, and Breast cancer patients do well, so really, I can make a big difference in how long they survive. Um, I love to see my patients. My patients come back and see me every year for checkups, mm -hmm. and it's really satisfying and honestly really fun to see those patients come back 10 years later and tell me how they're doing and how their kids are doing, and it is a super amazingly satisfying thing to do. Um, so I love what I do. That's I love great. to help with it. That's great. Um, any resources, websites, books, um, other information that you think might be helpful to, for our for our listeners out there? So, if you ever have you know any questions or just want to know more about breast cancer, my favorite website is breastcancer.org. Um, they have a really great uh, organization. They have very good graphics, um, and the the information is up to date, very well presented. So you can answer a lot of questions on your and, uh, websites like that. Also, the American Cancer Society's website is cancer.org. 
Um, the Komen Foundation has a good website also. Um, and I, I tell people, I don't mind if you go on the Internet. Just stay on reputable websites, right. <laughs> um, places where they're using, um, you know, journals and, and articles, research that has been reviewed um, and is known to be accurate. Um, there's a lot of great information, and I tell people, you know, if you learn about breast cancer, it's your job to share it. Um, so I think going on the website is great. Um, those, those things are really helpful. Um, knowledge is power. Yeah, and I, I think your advice about uh, filtering the information that you come across on the Internet could apply to a lot of different topics. <laughs> it could, yeah. Um, um, the cancer.org, by the way, has great information on a lot of other cancers, lung cancer, colon cancer, um, it's the American Cancer Society's website. And so there's a lot of things you can find um, on cancer.org, you know, for not just women, you know, for everyone um, has a risk of cancer. Yeah, I'm going to be sure to uh, include links to those in our show notes for today's episode. So thank you for passing those along. Um, any parting words of wisdom to share? My, my most important thing that I tell people is be proactive. Have your mammogram because the earlier and the smaller we find your cancer, the less treatment you need. The earlier we find your cancer, the better your survival. If you notice something different come in, um, I have a lot of patients who, you know, kind of ignore something until it gets to the point where they can't ignore it. The earlier you come in, you know, it may be benign, but if it's not, the better chance we have of treating it with less chemo, less radiation, you know, less therapy, and the better chance of survival. So be early. <laughs> Come in when something happens. It's real hard to prevent breast cancer, um, but the earlier we treat it, the less treatment you have to have. Um, and that's really the take home is come in, come see us. Well, I think that's a great way to wrap it up. Dr. Henshaw, thank you so much for taking time to be a part of this conversation. Thank you so much for all the work that you do to, um, to improve the lives of those who uh, are affected by breast cancer. And um, I'm just so honored to have you on the show and uh, hope we'll get a chance to talk again sometime. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure and uh, good luck. All right. Thanks so much. Dissect and Connect is sponsored by Teen Connections, a leadership program through Planned Parenthood South Atlantic that empowers youth with the facts about sexual health and the skills to build stronger, healthier relationships. It's free totally virtual, and you can earn $100 when you graduate as a Teen Connections peer educator in your community. Join a Teen Connections program from home today. For more information, be sure to check out the show notes from today's episode. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Dissect and Connect podcast. To learn more about Montgomery County Prevention Partners, our New River Valley Community Services, be sure to check us out on Facebook or visit nrvcs.org slash podcast.